1997, a brutal and unexpected murder gripped America. Scott for later, a mild-mannered, God-fearing man, stabbed his wife 44 times and dumped her body in the family swimming pool. I had never been at a scene as gruesome as that. Uh, I'd never seen that many stab wounds before on a person. We knew that uh, he was pretty much a cold-blooded killer and that he just plain wanted his wife to die. My assumption was that my brain had blown a gasket, that something had gone wrong in my head. When it came to court, Falater's defense was even more extraordinary. He wasn't mad, he was asleep. But Falater's case is just one of many brutal attacks in which the defense has claimed the assailant was sleepwalking. It's as if a person isn't real, you know, like a zombie or something. I felt like a monster, actually. So how is it possible for someone to maim and kill while they are asleep? And can juries be persuaded to believe what's almost unbelievable? The dangers of nighttime violence have become so serious for one man that he's come for tests to a special sleep disorder clinic at St. Thomas's Hospital in London. Darren Woodham lives in Leeds with his wife, Alison. He has woken on a number of occasions to discover that he is attacking her. Now he is looking for help before it's too late. My greatest fear is to wake up one morning next to Alison and she's dead. What if one night I'm strangling her and I don't stop, I don't wake up? It was in the first week that Darren and Alison slept together that things started to go wrong. All Darren remembers is a dream in which he felt he was under attack and fighting back. The reality was, it was Alison I was attacking. Um, I was on top of Alison. I had my, uh, my hands around her, a throat, one hand around her throat, and the other was covering her mouth. And I couldn't breathe properly, and I was trying to scream, and I couldn't... I just couldn't get any noise out. He had my eyes open, and she just thought that <laughs> this man actually had started seeing was just trying to kill her in her sleep. Darren had been an amateur boxer. Uncertain about what could be the cause of his nighttime violence, he even thought that it might be the result of his years in the ring. He then discovered from his parents that he had a history of sleepwalking as a child. He went to see his local doctor, who sent him to a psychiatrist. Nothing seemed to help. But the problem facing Darren Woodham is not as unusual as we may think. Help me! Help! A dad! Help me! Some people, like this young man, suffer from what are called night terrors. When he wakes, he's unlikely to have any memory of what has happened. But these night terrors can produce disturbed and frightening behavior. But what's called parasomnia can take several different forms. This woman may look as though she's awake, but in fact she is sleepwalking. She has woken, gone into her kitchen, and raided her fridge, all in her sleep. This man acts out his dreams. One patient like him tied himself to the bedpost each night to prevent himself from attacking his wife. Evidence from a 1997 poll of more than 4,000 people in the UK found that two in every hundred said they experienced some form of night violence. What we're doing here is really defining a third area of being. We're saying there's sleep, there's waking, and there's something that is in between that is not dreaming, you know, this is a state in which there is awake-looking behavior, but it's not fully awake. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. No, don't do that. During a normal night, there is usually a pattern to our sleeping. When we fall asleep, we descend through a number of stages into what is called slow wave or delta sleep, the deepest sleep of all. We then emerge from this slow wave sleep into a period of dreaming. This is called REM or rapid eye movement sleep. Normally our muscles are paralyzed during REM sleep to stop us acting out our dreams. 
The cycle of moving from dreaming to deep sleep is repeated roughly every 90 minutes. But for some people, this rhythm is dramatically disturbed. The sleepwalking episode, it's called a state transition disorder. This means that it occurs when you go from slow wave sleep to dreaming sleep. And at that point, the brain function changes. Now, in sleepwalkers, you don't get the complete transition from a slow wave sleep to dreaming sleep. And what happens is the mind is split off from the bodily actions. In other words, the person is capable of carrying out complex acts, but he doesn't know he's doing it. What is often comical and embarrassing can sometimes be dangerous, even deadly. They may get up and take a knife to the sofa or uh, to themselves, uh, rush out of a window or through a glass door uh, or some act of violence uh, that affects them or to another person. But violence does not only occur during episodes of sleepwalking. Some people suffer from what is called REM sleep behavior disorder. These are people who act out their dreams. Quite often that doesn't matter, but supposing you are being chased by somebody and you wish to attack them, um, then you may end up attacking your wife, but you do that for real. This could be exactly what Darren is suffering from. Darren and Alison were married in July 2000. Just married, a uh, three week holiday in front of us, it was just no plans. It was just a road trip, we were at the happiest point of our lives, weren't we? Sunglasses on all the way, <laughs> not in the spot of rain, to the background, look at that. Fantastic. It wasn't until uh, about a week and a half into the, the holiday we had the first problem. Um, we found this really nice hotel and uh, we decided we loved it so much we wanted to spend another night there. So we, we rebooked, but they couldn't find us a room within the main complex. So they put us into some, uh, what can I describe as converted, converted stables, stable. weren't they? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that was, uh, that was the worst night of my entire life. It's been about four o'clock in the morning. I thought I awoke and I looked up um, and I just looked around and what I was seeing was like some sort of, uh, I can't say it was maybe an entity or something in the corner. Um, and I looked trying to find Alison to see if Alison was safe. And what I saw was Alison had been gagged. Um, to a table. I woke up with him on top of me and he was grabbing me tight. I mean, you know, he grabbed me so tight that I can't breathe. My instant thought was he was attacking me, so I was trying to get him off me, but that was making him worse. And he was talking and, and shouting. I can't remember what he was saying. I don't think it was making proper sense. I thought I was stood up at the end of the bed and I was shouting to Alison, turn the light on, turn the light on, I can't see where this thing is. And she was screaming and all this noise, well, it woke everybody up to the shouting around apart us. Apart from you. Apart from me. I was still <laughs> visualising this thing attacking both of us now. I think what he was seeing in his dream, there was a cabinet at the side of me at this sort of level when I was led down, and it's like a bedside cabinet, and it actually pulled that over the top of me. You turn the light on, like, that, that didn't wake me up. Um, and it must have been a minute with the light being on, and then I sort of, as if I was waking up, the two images balanced themselves out, and then I was looking at the proper room, and. I looked at Alison, who was crying, and uh, you know she just looked so frightened. And uh, I said, "I've just dreamt that, haven't I, Al?" And she said, "Yeah." And uh, we both broke down, didn't we? Mm. So. Darren has not attacked Alison since the honeymoon, but his nights are still so disturbed and frightening that they now sleep with a light on. Where, 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 where I was 
Here I am supposed to be loving and protecting Alison, and the only danger that she's in now is with me. You know. You, you hear about these people on television that, uh, that beat the wives up, and you know it's awful. <clears throat> but uh, I envy them in a way because they can get help. They can stop that. They know they're doing it. Darren has been through the sleep disorder tests and is still trying to get a precise diagnosis of his problem. He is about to start a course of drugs, which he hopes will be some sort of a cure. But Darren and Alison now sleep apart, and until a solution is found, their nights will always be blighted. While we're doing these like experiments, there's, you know, Alison's still in, in danger. You know, the woman I love that I would never lay a finger on, I'm hurting. On a night, I'm attacking her. I'm putting her life in danger. We want something sorted now quickly, really. On March 17, 1997, in Toronto, Canada, a woman was the victim of a brutal and unprovoked attack while she slept in her apartment near the city centre. Police were called to the scene to intervene in what appeared to be a domestic row. But as they arrived at the home of Arlene Robinson, a woman burst through the door, bleeding heavily from deep wounds in her neck. I suffered several lacerations on my fingers. I had um, five slashes, two stab wounds. My esophagus was punctured uh, one centimeter through and through. There was no question who did it. Arlene's boyfriend, George Campbell. But he remembered nothing about the stabbing. His only memory was falling asleep. Next thing I remember is the police putting handcuff on my hand and I'm going to jail. I didn't remember doing it. That's why I didn't have an explanation. For Arlene, the memories of that night are all too vivid. It had started out as a normal evening at home with her boyfriend. We drank, we, we had a couple of joints. We went to bed, we made love, and we fell asleep. And then the next thing I knew was when I woke up to, you know, everything happening. grabbed my chin and just started slashing my throat. It's as if a person isn't real, you know, like a zombie or something. And his eyes are all glazed over and... And then he said, um, what happened, what happened? What's going on? And I'm saying to him, take a look at me, I'm dying, you know? You know, and he's like, what happened, what happened? And I'm saying, look at me, you did this. I felt like a monster, actually, to know that, like, I could have actually done something like that, you know? Campbell, a marijuana user with no history of violence, was taken to prison and charged with attempted murder. When his lawyer arrived, he found his client in a state of total confusion. He didn't have a clue what had happened, and uh, it was a very difficult position. When the police are outside the door, and the woman comes out stabbed as badly as she was, and he is there immediately as the only person present. Factually, there's not a big issue in terms of criminal law. The issue was, of course, trying to figure out what was going on in his head at the time. If anything, that was the problem. When it came to his trial, Campbell had no alternative but to plead guilty to attempted murder. But with no rational explanation for Campbell's violence, he was sent for psychiatric assessment before being sentenced. The psychiatrist became curious about one detail of the case, Arlene's description of Campbell as he carried out the attack. One point that struck me was that she said he appeared glassy-eyed and he did not appear to be with it. And that raised my doubts about Mr. Campbell truly being in, in, in a state of total awareness and all the more raised doubts, and I had suggested even strongly then that one should investigate the possibility of sleepwalking. Dr. Goja's suspicions about Campbell were soon confirmed. One of the first things doctors discovered was that Campbell had a history of sleepwalking. He'd had one or two previous episodes 
where he had found himself waking up in a different place to where he went to sleep. So on one occasion, he, for example, had been uh, in a basement room and woke up in an upstairs room in the nude and couldn't account for how he had in made that transition during the night. After further tests in a Toronto hospital, Dr. Shapiro ruled out Campbell's drug abuse as a cause of the attack on Arlene. What he found, though, was a sleep pattern marked by sudden arousals from deep sleep into a state of semi-consciousness, exactly what happens in parasomnia or sleepwalking. Most of us would go from deep sleep to medium sleep to light sleep and then to a, a, an awakening or that sort of a sequence of events. And when people have that abrupt arousal from deep sleep, we think of that as more or less a thumbprint typical of a parasomnia. With the psychiatrists convinced that Campbell was sleepwalking when he attacked Arlene, his lawyer had to persuade the judge to take the unusual step of allowing Campbell to change his plea from guilty to not guilty. The court agreed and decided that Campbell was not criminally responsible for the attack. People were comfortable with the, the sleepwalking diagnosis because he hadn't come up with it. It had only been discovered after the fact. He demonstrated a great deal of remorse, of course. He pleaded guilty to the offence and there was no motive. George Campbell is breathing a big sigh of relief tonight. He woke up this morning expecting to go to jail. But today, the judge, the Crown and the defense all agreed Campbell was not criminally responsible because of his parasomnia or sleepwalking. He's not obviously to have any weapons. He's not to have any contact with the victim. He's not to take illegal substances. And he's to continue treatment with two psychiatrists. But when the authorities reviewed the case against Campbell, even these conditions were dropped. Now in perhaps the most unexpected twist of the story, a year after the trial for the attack that nearly killed her, Arlene is back with her boyfriend. But sleepwalking isn't the only disorder that can cause someone to behave violently in their sleep. Mike Rixkers lived near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He suffered from what's called sleep apnea. Nearly 10 years ago, he shot his wife. Moments after a Butler County Court jury convicted him of first-degree murder, 38-year-old Michael Rixers hugged his sobbing mother and then was taken off to jail. During the trial, he claimed that a sleep disorder called sleep apnea caused him to fatally shoot his wife with a 357 that was kept in the bedroom for protection. This gentleman uh, was one of the worst sleep apneas we'd ever seen. He stopped breathing 124 times per hour. He had falls in his oxygen levels down to the floor. I mean, this man turned blue. And he had over 400 awakenings in one night recording period. Just a tremendous amount of disrupted sleep. When you have a situation like that, you can get essentially into an altered state, an altered state of consciousness, somewhere in that netherworld between wake and sleep, where you do things and you have no awareness. Rick Skurs was a welder by trade. He lived in Butler County, 20 miles from the city, in a mobile home. He had been a sick man for some time. He was grossly overweight, a condition that caused both severe breathing problems and a chaotic sleeping pattern. Rixkers had been married to his wife Janet for six years. It had been a volatile relationship, but with two young children, Janet and Mike Rixkers had stuck together. Then, in the small hours of December 26, 1993, Rixkers shot his wife with a handgun they kept in the bed for protection against intruders. That night, Rixkers went to bed late. His wife was already asleep. thing I remembered until I woke up to what sounded like a, a balloon being popped underneath of a blanket. A poof. I jumped up out of bed and I just reached down and swept the gun out of the bed and I looked at my wife and she was making some kind of a, a moaning noise and that's when I went out to make the phone call. Is there, is there not one one? 
Yeah, it's yeah. for it. Huh? My wife was shot in the leg. Your wife was shot in the leg? Right, my handgun. Is she conscious right now? I don't know. She's in the back bedroom. I just come out here to get fun. Was it an accidental shooting? Yes, it was. I don't know what I was dreaming about. But please, get an ambulance here. Okay, we're getting a crew. So if they get screwed up, we'll get them up there. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. In fact, Janet Rixkers had not been shot in the leg. A single bullet had gone through her heart. Rixkers, confused and panic-stricken, waited for the police to arrive. Meanwhile, he telephoned his mother. He called and he said, Mom, come right away, he said. I think I shot Jan. So when I went up there, was police cars, there was ambulance, and oh, everything was just flashing. When I went in, he was sitting there, and I said, Mike, what happened? And it was like, I could see him, like that, pulling the air up. And um, he said, I don't know, Mom. He said, they aren't telling me anything, but it isn't good. Police officers investigating at the scene of the killing found the facts didn't fit Rixka's explanation that the shooting had been accidental. He indicated to the officer that he had been asleep, heard a bang, woke up, and found a gun in his hand. But most significantly, he seemed not particularly upset about the whole episode, as one would expect him to be, had he, through a tragic accident, caused his wife's death. When police examined the body, they found more evidence to suggest that Rixkers was a cold-blooded killer. The uh, officer found that the body was cold, which led us to conclude that he waited and made a phone call after he was certain she was dead. Rixkers was arrested and charged with the murder of his wife. But while he was awaiting trial, he was sent to the local hospital in Butler for treatment for his increasingly serious breathing problems and the sleeping difficulties they caused. Rixkers was examined by doctors in the hospital's sleep disorder unit. The tests showed that he suffered from sleep apnea, a breathing condition that deprived his body of oxygen during the night, destroying any chance of getting sufficient rest. If I were to take a Morse code oscillator, a little beeper, and I put it next to your ear, and I turned it loud enough to disrupt your sleep, but not so loud that you wake up completely, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that beeper off every minute across the night, and I'm going to do that to you night after night after night. Over time, you're like a watch spring winding down. You're going to be profoundly tired. Rixka's family had been aware of these symptoms for years, but until the shooting, hadn't thought much of it. I can remember on the expressway going to work one morning, I passed him, he was sleeping in the truck. I guess he couldn't make it. Another time he was talking to the fellows at work and he just fell on the floor and went to sleep. And Christmas day, the day before this happened, we were all at the table having dinner and I had taken some pictures and um, he got halfway through his meal and he fell to sleep. But the reduction in the oxygen supply in sleep apnea patients produces a second symptom one that might explain what happened on the night Janet Rixkers died. It tends to stir up very vivid dreams and nightmares, and we wondered if that's essentially what didn't happen in this particular case, uh, almost what we call a hypnagogic hallucination. It's somewhere between reality and dream, and you can act out and do behaviors in a, an unnatural state like that, a dissociated state like that, where you're part awake and part in REM. In fact, Rixkers had told police on the night of the shooting that he thought he had been dreaming. When they asked me what happened, all I could tell them was that I thought that I was dreaming about hunting or someone trying to break into the house. But that's all I can really remember. When the case came to trial in Butler, Rixkers pleaded not guilty claiming he was suffering from a sleeping disorder at the time of the shooting. The central appeal of the prosecution to the jury was simple. Was it plausible that Rixkers could have fired the gun without knowing it while he was asleep? The district attorney ridiculed the possibility. It just seemed incredible. Uh, you know, you could accept somebody being asleep and perhaps swinging their arm and giving somebody a black eye or something like that, but to be able to 
define, aim, and discharge a handgun like that. Uh, it's a little hard to believe. This is really, when you get down to it, not all that complex. He's laying in a bed, the gun is there, he has a dream that he's, he's, he's uh, in a hunt, and the thing goes off. I mean, I, and then he wakes up from the blast, which is enough to wake anybody, including somebody with sleep apnea, and, uh, and calls 911. So I think it is plausible that this was an accident, uh, based on the fact that he had such a disrupted sleep and such a severe sleep disorder. But the jury decided to ignore the evidence of Dr. Klein and found Rixkas guilty. He's now serving a life sentence. I was quite upset when, when he was found uh, guilty. I felt in my gut that there was an injustice done. And uh, I, would, I would hope that uh, uh, he could get the best legal team possible and have an appeal because I, I, I firmly believe this needs another airing. I do. It was the doubts about the complexity of Rixka's behavior while supposedly asleep that destroyed his defense. But what about the case of a man who apparently drove 14 miles to kill his mother-in-law? Would a jury really believe he was asleep? It all started when Ken Park stumbled into a police station in Toronto, his hands bleeding heavily, and told the duty officer that he may have killed someone. When his lawyer arrived, she found her client had no idea what had happened. He was very, very unclear about what he did, if anything. He knew he had had a knife. Um, he tossed the knife down in the car. He had this image of his, his uh, mother-in-law's face. Uh, but I don't think at that time he, in fact, knew. He was trying to reconstruct through little pools of memory what may have happened. As the police began their investigation, the basic facts became clear. This appeared to be what happened. Parks had fallen asleep watching the television. At some point during the night, he got up, picked up his car keys and went out to his car. He then drove 14 miles along a Toronto freeway and through three sets of traffic lights to the home of his mother and father-in-law. When he arrived, he attacked his father-in-law with a tire wrench and stabbed his mother-in-law with her own knife in a violent struggle that left her dead and him with badly cut hands. He then got back into his car and drove off. It was during this journey that he apparently woke up, found himself covered in blood and drove to a local police station. But as Parks could remember none of this, his lawyer had to try to piece together a defense herself. Within 24 hours, she'd arranged for a psychological assessment of her client. When I first saw him, he was uh, in tears and was, in, in my view, in a total state of confusion. He did not remember what had happened. He had bits and pieces of what he felt or what he thought had transpired, but wasn't sure. He was exceptionally anxious and agitated and absolutely bewildered. Who then was Ken Parks? Parks was 23 years old. He'd been married to Karen for three years and they had a five month old daughter. Parks had started betting on the horses at the Toronto racetrack and lost badly. As a result, he'd got into serious financial difficulties. His gambling drained the family accounts and he began embezzling money from the electronics company he worked for. The mounting debts and his attempts to cover them up put severe strain on the marriage. But none of this explained why Parks had turned into a killer. Above all, there was no reason why he should have killed his parents-in-law. You know, people just don't kill for nothing. And I was absolutely satisfied that not only was there no motive, but that Ken was enormously attached to both his mother-in-law and his father-in-law. Uh, she was uh, one of his great allies. So if there was no motive, could Parks have been mentally ill? His psychologist didn't think so. I did not think that Ken Parks was psychotic, but I could not rule out that he suffered from a dissociative state, a brief psychotic episode, uh, psychogenic amnesia, or whether or not it was more neurologically based, uh, epilepsy or a variety of central nervous system disorders. Uh, I wasn't qualified to, uh, to explore those areas, 
And that's why the team was uh, developed. That team of medical experts, including a sleep specialist and a geneticist, met at the lawyer's offices. By a process of elimination, the sleepwalking defense slowly emerged. Around that meeting, uh, we uh, formed a tentative conclusion that it may be sleepwalking. And then we went on and did the genetic inquiries, and it just got more and more solid and clearer. And, and there was no other reasonable hypothesis because there was no motive. Parks now seem to have a defense. But could a sleepwalker really drive 14 miles and stab to death someone he knew well? They're not fully awake, they're not fully asleep. I mean, it's clear that the motor activity is there. They can get up, they can do complex behaviors. They can't recognize people. Face recognition is turned off. Space recognition is fully intact. Like in Ken Park's case, he drove, which was a typical behavior for him. He knew how to do that at a very low level of functioning. But he woke up over the body of a woman who he didn't recognize. He calls her, he says, I woke up over the body of a woman with a help me look on her face. He didn't know he'd attacked her, he didn't know she was dead. When it came to the trial, Parks pleaded not guilty to murdering his mother-in-law, arguing that he was not mentally ill, he simply didn't know what he was doing because he was sleepwalking. The prosecution needed to convince the jury that this defense was just not credible. I just think from like a lay person's common sense perspective that, that it just seems completely implausible that one could act with such specificity or engage in such goal-directed, complicated behavior to bring about an event while sleeping and not have some idea of what uh, one was doing. That's the way the Crown attempted to appeal to the jury. I spent a great deal of time calling all the experts, the general psychiatrists and neurologists, they all testified. So the jury um, listened to an extremely complex uh, discussion of what other factors were considered, why they were rejected, why sleepwalking um, was uh, accepted by all of them as, a, as what was going on at the time. After a three-week trial, and to many people's surprise, Ken Parks was acquitted. I'm not satisfied that we really know what we're talking about here. It's just not good enough to say there is nothing going on in the mind while somebody is driving on a controlled access highway and then kills people he knows. It's, there's something there. We just don't know what it is. And until we sort that out, um, I'm going to be very skeptical, I think. I had absolute confidence in in that verdict. I had confidence in the diagnosis. I believe the jury just was, you know, 12 men and women who were sensible and listened to the evidence and did what I would have done. The Parks case set an important medical and legal precedent. The prosecution appealed to Canada's Supreme Court, but the court ruled that sleepwalking was not a mental illness, and it was right that Parks walked free. But did that mean he was no longer a danger? They based their judgment on this being a one-time only occurrence and that it, it would never happen again, therefore it was all right to acquit him. I'm not sure that's true. I think if you're prone to this problem, it might repeat. And in fact, Ken called me and he said he was afraid he might have another episode. And he asked me whether I could get him back on medication. And I said, of course. You know, if you feel you're dangerous, you should be medicated to prevent this. A full 10 years later, the Parks acquittal would play a part in the defense of a killer in Phoenix, Arizona. Scott Falater, a committed member of the Mormon church with an apparently solid marriage, is now serving life without parole for a frenzied attack on his wife, Yamila. One January evening in 1997, 
for later was trying to mend the pump on his swimming pool. As it grew dark, he gave up and decided to go to bed. I remember coming in, um, she had actually fallen asleep on the couch. And I woke her up and, and, and told her good night, and I went to bed. The next things I remember were sort of awakening and knowing that there was a great deal of commotion around the house, people yelling, dogs barking. And the, the first memory that I have that's clear was seeing a policeman standing with a gun extended at full arm's length. His first words out of his mouth to me were, what's wrong, what's going on? Um, and I made some statements to him to the effect that I didn't believe him. I felt I was dealing with a brutal murderer, uh, a vicious killer. Falater was arrested, handcuffed, and bundled into a police car outside his house. And while I was in there, um, they had one of the windows partially open, and I could hear some conversations going on between them. And from those conversations, I could tell that they thought that I had killed my wife. Uh, that was obviously pretty confusing. Falater may have been confused but it didn't take police long to work out what had happened. Well, the, the sequence of events are, are as follows. He first stabs her the 44 times. He changes out of the clothing, uh, does away, or tries to secrete the evidence, if you will, in the trunk of the, the uh, Volvo, goes upstairs, cleans up, comes back down and stands over her. And uh, I guess maybe he didn't know that from stab wounds you don't die immediately. What, the reason you die from stab wounds is that you bleed out. And uh, she was still alive when he came down. What happened next was witnessed over the wall by Faleta's neighbor. He steps over the top of her and picks her up by the hands and drags her back to the edge of the pool. And then steps around her, picks up her legs, moves them to the edge of the pool, kneels behind her and rolls her into the water. Specifically grabs a hold of her head and I'm thinking to hold her head above water. And then I realize he's not holding her head above water, but he's holding it below water. And that's when I went back inside and called 911. As police carried out a detailed search of the scene, they came across more damning evidence in the garage. They went into the back of Falater's Volvo estate and opened up the wheel well. And uh, in that uh, wheel well, we found a black trash bag, and uh, in looking inside that trash bag, we found a larger type Tupperware container that was sealed, and as we unsealed it, we found the, the bloody Levi's, the bloody t-shirt, and additionally the knife that uh, had been used uh, in the attack, and next to it, inside that same bag, were a pair of gloves that he had worn subsequently to, to drown her, and then also the uh, shoes and the socks that he'd been wearing. So far as the police and prosecution were concerned, they had their man. With Falater himself stained with his wife's blood, the case could hardly have been more straightforward. Why he did it, we didn't know, and we always did search for a motive, but were unable to find one. But we knew that uh, he was pretty much a cold-blooded killer and that he just plain wanted his wife to die. Scott Falater was interrogated by police and confronted with the fact that he had killed his wife. What did she do that set you off like that? Nothing. Help me with this, Scott. This is hard for me to understand. This isn't normal in your lifestyle, in your pattern. You can say that again. I just don't know. It was, it was a very tough, sad time. It was a mixture of things because I was still confused, uh, not quite awake, to be honest with you. Um, and uh, when he's accusing me of doing it, you know, it, it, it's just like it was a nightmare. You know, the whole thing was a, a nightmare to me. I just don't know. I loved her. I've been married all my adult life. She certainly didn't deserve to die. As Falater tried to make sense of the nightmare, he could come to only one conclusion. 
uh, my assumption was that my brain had blown a gasket, that something had gone wrong in my head. And I, I asked my lawyer, I said, uh, I, I, we need a shrink here to, to see if just something has gone wrong with me. My assumption was that something had gone wrong in my head and that I must be insane. But if Valeta had not gone mad, what could have provoked such a ferocious and motiveless attack? At first, his lawyer was at a loss. Well, you know, you, you just say, where's my defense? There had to be some reason for this, and there just wasn't. And the only thing that came up was his mother saying, the only thing abnormal about Scott was, because he was always the perfect child, is that he would walk in his sleep. And it was actually the sister, uh, Laura, that picked up from there to do the research, and she came across the Ken Parks case. And uh, the more and more I got into it, the more and more I became convinced this is what had happened. He was asleep when it happened. When Falater eventually appeared in court, the trial was shown across America. State of Arizona has charged the defendant Scott Lewis Falater with first degree murder. And they have alleged that uh, Mr. Falater, on or about the 16th day of January, 1997, intending or knowing that his conduct would cause death with premeditation, caused the death of Yarmola Falater. Uh, From the start, the prosecution tried to portray Falater as a brutal and calculating killer. She went down, started to go down. She went down to the ground. And he continued to stab her. And he stabbed her in the back. And he just continued to stab her over and over again. And it's not like she didn't struggle, because she did. But There was no argument that Falater had killed his wife, but his lawyer had to convince the jury of his unusual defense. He did it without any conscious thought. He did it without awareness because he was sleepwalking. Now let me take you to 1996 and the Scott Bolliger family. This is the family. I knew that the biggest hurdle I would always have is trying to convince a jury that somebody uh, in a sleepwalking state, could stab his wife 43 times. You know, I would have rather had any defense other than a person who was sleepwalking. In an effort to convince the jury, Mike Kimmerer called expert witnesses to support for later's sleepwalking defense. Among them, Dr. Rosalind Cartwright. This, this is then an awake-looking record or an aroused-looking record. And the muscle is very relaxed while he's sleeping, but as soon as he arouses, this tone comes back up so that he can move around. The tests carried out by Dr. Cartwright showed something exceptional about Falater's sleep pattern. She was convinced he was not dreaming at the time of the attack, but he was almost certainly suffering from three separate sleep disorders, sleepwalking, night terrors, and confusional arousal. What's more, he would have no memory of anything that happened, while he was under their influence. Uh, the memories really start when he's almost down at the foot of the stairs, so that he is still in a confusional state until he gets near the bottom of the stairs and sees the police officer who ca uh, came in and arrested him. For Rosalind Cartwright, the details of Falater's actions on the night of the murder only made sense if he was in a confused state as a result of sleepwalking. I mean, a smart man would never have done what Scott did, and he's a very smart man. I mean, a smart man would not have committed the murder under his children's bedroom window. I mean, it's amazing the kids slept through this, but they did. I mean, none of this makes sense if you're fully awake, only if you're in a strange, bizarre, in-between state. But in court, despite the expert witnesses, the evidence was stacking up against Falata, suggesting that he was in his right mind and that the killing was premeditated. He didn't come unprepared, or he didn't come without something or an agenda. What he actually came with was this knife right here, as he stood right next to What I did is I focused on the facts themselves. The fact that he washed up, that shows that he's trying to hide what he just did, which means that he knows what he did is wrong. Additionally, hiding the uh, items, the bloody clothing in the, in, the, in the trunk of the car, coming back and then drowning the victim or attempting to drown the victim even though she was going to die, indicates premeditation. So 
the premeditation aspect was not the difficult uh, part of the case for me. It was to show whether or not he was voluntarily acting out as opposed to sleepwalking. The part that was the most difficult to explain as far as the evidence went were the events after the stabbing. And that was what the neighbor saw over the fence when he saw Scott pull the body to the pool. He went in and changed his clothes. He walked through the house. He came out. Uh, those are the things that were just impossible to overcome. Uh, and you could tell as the case went along, uh, the jury was not buying the defense. They had a hard time accepting the defense. All right, please. At the end of the trial, and after eight hours' deliberation, the jury gave its verdict. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been informed that you have a verdict. And uh, is that true? Yes. Can yes. okay, clerk will please report the verdict? We, the jury, duly impanel and sworn in the above entitled action, upon our oaths, do find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree. The jury convicted for later, and the judge sentenced him to life in prison without parole. One and all? Yes. yes. Maybe he's paying the price of our ignorance just because we're not scientifically sophisticated enough yet to understand the, the dangers that lurk out there with sleep and sleep disorders. Hopefully, you know, in 10 years, we'll know more about that. There's a lot of denial in people who just cannot believe that someone who's a sleepwalker can be that dangerous. Fortunately, it's very rare but you need to take it seriously enough. And because the treatments are so simple uh, and so effective, there's no reason to take the risk. Uh, you should just go to see a sleep doctor, have him diagnose the kind of sleepwalking you have, and then have it taken care of. And that way there is no risk of something like this happening. I would hate to think that something like this can happen in other families, in other homes. It's uh, obviously destroyed my family and my home.